Yeah, welcome everybody. My name is Ute Radespiel and I will be uh, moderating the session today, the TU, TU Seminar, Tropical Ecology Online Seminar that we have today, uh, two weeks before Christmas, so to say. Uh, we have three interesting, exciting talks ahead of us, which you see on this slide with a slightly changed order. But before we go into this, we have three guests, Vincent Montard, Antonia Reinhardt and Juliette Duval talking all about paleoecological topics uh, in the tropics. Before we delve into this, uh, I would like to take you for a couple of slides uh, into the background of this series. So um, we are the Society of Tropical Ecology and we have been hampered uh, in our contact with our members for quite some time during the Corona crisis. But we are usually having a lot of activities. Uh, we have an, an annual international conference. The next of it will be in June 2023 in the Czech Republic in Ceske Budujovice. Um, and we have a journal, Ecotropica, which is open access and peer reviewed and uh, publishes at no costs. We have grants and awards, awards uh, available to members of various kinds, travel grants, research grants and a Marian Award. And we have uh, also, uh, that is uh, an attractive tool for um, new, for, for young researchers um, coming into the society. You have a tropical ecology student group that everybody is welcome to join. So there are a lot of reasons why you should become, could become members. You can profit from it and you can become member of our community and uh, a regular exchange on interesting topics on the tropical ecology. Um, we started um, during the Corona crisis with uh, this TO seminar talk series in order to bridge the gap from our yearly conferences, we, which we couldn't hold for two years due to the crisis. But now we are back uh, on, on a normal track and we decided to continue because it is such a success event. And uh, the general framework for this topical uh, tropical Ecology online series is that we have a talk series every second Monday of the month at three, three o'clock in the afternoon, CET. And um, then this is also a, a, a way, a platform which allows early career researchers to present ongoing research and to come together with other interested scientists uh, to discuss about their results. Um, and we have this always as a combination between presentation of established researchers and uh, one or two presentation by early career researchers. Today, we will have two of them. And uh, then in the end of the three talks, we have one longer session of discussion, which will then combine questions that come up uh, to all of these talks that are presented of, on a day. And, um, we have today three speakers. Uh, Vincent Montard is a researcher as, at the CNRS in Montpellier in France, and he is an, already an expert on quaternary tropical paleoecology. He has worked in various different countries, in uh, Chile, Brazil, Kenya, and Madagascar. And he uses uh, pollen research, pollenology, and multi-proxy approaches to reconstruct vegetation history in various places. And he always looks and aims to understand how past climatic changes and human impact have shaped current ecosystems and the future trajectories in the context of future climate change. And Antonia Reinhardt is actually a master's student, but she already published successfully, and that is also the content of the presentation today, but she is a master's student still at the Department of Polynology and Climate Dynamic Dynamics at the University of Göttingen in Germany and is interested in reconstructing the vegetation history in parts of Madagascar in the context of possible early, early human impact. And she is a student of Professor Hermann Behling there at this department. And uh, Juliette Dival is a PhD student at the Institute of Research for Development in Montpellier in France. And she studies the evolution of the fire ecology in the savanna ecosystem in Cameroon and uses ethnoecology, paleoecology, and remote sensing to understand the link between human-induced burning, landscape dynamics, and social e ecological changes over time. So these are the three speakers of today. 
And uh, we are already recording now. So how do we find the TU seminars? We find them on our webpage. There you can find the link to the to the YouTube channel or go directly to YouTube and uh, look for, look out for the seminar series there. So I think that is it for now. Let me check. Yes, that it is for now. And uh, we have a bit changed the order of speakers because that was what was requested by the speakers. Um, it would make sense. And I will now stop my screen sharing and uh, it would be now to up to Antonia, I think, to put up her presentation and start. And then we will have Vincent Montard second and Juliette Duval as a third speaker afterwards yes thank you um okay can you see my presentation yes we can okay thanks okay so welcome to my presentation about vegetation dynamics in northern madagascar during the past millennia, intensified human impact and climatic influence result into rainforest fragmentations on Nosy Bay Island. Um, okay, no. Um, I would like to um, start with a small introduction to Madagascar. As you can see, um, Madagascar has quite a unique flora and fauna. It has 12,000 plant species and 96% of the trees are endemic. This is why Madagascar is considered to be a biodiversity hotspot. Um, it is known that human impact during recent times has greatly influenced the natural vegetation of Madagascar. As you can see here, for example, we have a lot of recent deforestations. However, it is still in discussion how early human humans, so example from about 1000 years ago, impacted Madagascar's natural vegetation. About this time, for example, we have the first occurrence of dry forested habitats, such as savannas and a megafauna decline on Madagascar. And it is still in discussion if these events happen due to human impact or due to natural ar aridification. To disentangle this question further, there was one popular study done on Nose Bay Island um, from Bernie et al. in 2003, and they analyzed the sediment core from Lake Ampara Bay here for sporomela and charcoal. Sporomela is a spore known to grow on dung, for example, and this is why they took the rice in sporomela at 1130 years before present as evidence of the first occurrence on, on livestock, of livestock on Madagascar. Sadly, in this study, there was no vegetation record done. And this is why we decided to go back to the study site to establish our own vegetation record. So this is our study site, Nusi Bay Island. This is the island. It is located in the northwestern part of Madagascar. And this is uh, the lake of our study site. Our research, our research aim was specifically to reconstruct the vegetation dynamics and fire regimes during the past two millennia and to evaluate the impact of humans and or natural aridification on Nosy Bay Island. This is a picture of our study site. This is our Lake Ampari Bay with an elevation of, 20, uh, of uh, 71 meter, water depth 45 meters, and the sediment core we took was 1.65 meters long. As you can see on this map, according to its climatic conditions, Nusi Bay Island um, should be in the vegetation biome of a subhumid forest. Um, however, as you can see on the picture, we have many other vegetation types here as well. So not only subhumid forest, but also um, grassland, um, bushland mosaic, and secondary forest. Um, now I would like to talk a little bit about um, the results of our study. Our main result was that we have a quite huge ecosystem shift at 1,300 years before present. This you can see in our vegetation diagram here. Um, 
Here at the left-hand side marked in green, we have all arboreal pollen found in our samples. And you can see here from, uh, from 2,500 to 1,300, um, we have a large amount of arboreal pollen in our samples. It's always between 70 and 80 percent. And this is what we would um, expect for a natural biome of a subhumid forest. However, at 1,300 years before present, you can see quite clearly that we have a sudden decrease in arboreal pollen, and on the other hand, in uh, yeah, sudden increase in poaceae pollen. So what happened in, during that time is that um, this natural forest was somehow destroyed or it, it somehow went away and um, suddenly we have a lot of grassland in this area. This we can also see um, at, um, in our MPPs. MPPs are non-paleomorphs, so mainly spores and fungi for example. And um, you can see here especially for the Sapotrophus and cor Corpophilius spores, um, for the Conichocheta spores here, that we have a sudden rise at 1,300 years before present. Um, these spores are known to grow on dung or on dead wood, so that means during that time we probably had a higher occurrence of um, dung and dead wood. We see this shift also at 1,300 uh, years before present in the abundance of fire. As you can see here, um, we have a sudden occurrence of, um, of shock roll on the right hand side. On the left hand side, we have our um, curve for magnetic susceptibility and every time there is a peak there that means that the soil was probably disturbed due to burning for example so this uh, fits quite good together. Then we decided to have a closer look at this transition phase here um, and we sampled every one centimeter and analyzed it for charcoal particles and for poise pollen. And you can see here that we have at um, we have an initial high peak of charcoal, and then this is followed by um, a rise in poaceae pollen. Um, so what we think happened here is that uh, the people probably or the humans started burning the forest, and in order to um, make space for cattle and for agriculture. So this is when uh, we have a regrowth of poaceae, which was then yeah, used for cattle and agriculture. And this is why we put um, the initial start of human impact or where we think human impact started at 1,300 before present, right, right in between this um, transitioning part. Um, this also fits together quite nicely with the first findings of Asian crop we have here. Um, this was a story um, done by Crowell that all in 2016, and their first findings um, of Asian crops uh, were about 1,250 years old. So um, yeah, it fits quite nicely together with our start of um, impact on OZB and simultaneously archaeological findings also start to appear at about 1,000 uh, years before present, also at Lake Empire Bay and at the nearby mainland Mahalika. And there we found, for example, uh, the archaeologists found, for example, fish and turtle bones um, used by humans. So in conclusion, human impact uh, probably started at um, about 1,300 years before present on Lozi Bay Island. Uh, humans destroyed the natural um, subhumid forest vegetation which was found there. 
Um, however, this can only be said for Nozi B. So the rela relationship between human impact and natural aridification may differ across Madagascar. And in order to disentangle this relationship further, of course, um, we need more research. And um, talking about more research, I would just quickly like to inform you of our, our next step or my next step. Um, I'm doing right now during my master thesis, I'm analyzing um, sediment core from Lake Ravelobe, which is located here. And I just got my very first um, results. And as you can see, it looks a little bit different. This is simply because um, the vegetation type which is growing there is um, quite different than as so it's not subhuman forest it's just more natural and there's uh, natural that uh, poor sea pollen occur there so we have more poor sea for example but still you can see here for example we have a high peak of poor sea at about 1135 years before present and we think this might might be a peak of human influence, um, also because we have a high amount of chakra in this two samples. Um, so yeah, but as I said, this is only very first results. We do not know a lot about the sediment core yet. It's just to tell you that, yeah, it's, it's still exciting and we have many new results. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, I'm looking forward to Vincent's talk. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Antonia. And uh, I think we switch right over to Vincent Montard and you can share your screen and you will stay with Madagascar, I believe. Yeah, okay. So, do you see everything correctly? Yes. Yeah. So first, it's a pleasure to present my work in uh, Society of Tropical Ecology, the European one. And thank you to the organizer to invite me to for this opportunity. So me, I will talk, I will continue to talk about Madagascar, but um, I will also talk about the late Holocene, and, uh, but I will extend a bit this time scale to the late Quaternary and the, from the Holocene to the last glacial transition. So first, Within the context of Madagascar, I think uh, um, paleoecological research are really important, um, as Antonia did, to understand past human impact before the past decades, to understand to understand the original vegetation before human perturbation and, uh, and disturbances. But uh, I think also pa paleoecological research in Madagascar are really important to understand uh, in a more general way vegetation responses to climate oscillation. And uh, in the context of uh, recent deforestation in, on the past decade in Madagascar, I think it's critical to uh, to uh, to know how to um, restore uh, vegetation, wooden vegetation, but also to understand the res resilience of of uh, rainforest or forest and and also all kind of vegetation growing on the on the island. And uh, within the context of global warming, global warming is really critical to to have this knowledge and to improve this knowledge. But so far, there is not so much uh, paleoecological research done in Madagascar. The first work uh, which have been done was made by Herbert Straka, and then people know more the work of uh, David Burney, which was done in the 80s and in the 90s. And since that, a uh, few records have been published, uh, such as uh, the one from Malika Virasami, but also um, Cathy Willis. Uh, but uh, today I was thinking to, to, to make first a kind of synthesis about all this work which I've done previously. But at the same time, I was thinking maybe it could be too long or not enough detail because at the end, we do not have so much data for every region. So I was thinking to, to give you some input about the limitations we have in with paleological, paleological research uh, when we are focusing uh, specifically on one site and I wanted to, uh, to speak about this limitation because it's really interesting for, for us, for paleoecological research to, to not use only one site, but to confront, compare different sites to, to, to try to have um, uh, environmental synthesis at a regional scale 
uh, of uh, environmental changes. So I will uh, use two examples, basically, to, uh, to, to speak about this limitation. The first example is uh, focusing on the late Holocene, and uh, I will compare the Nozibe results that uh, Antonia just presented before with the uh, with, uh, Montagne d'Ambre, which is in the same region in the north of Madagascar. And uh, then I will compare two other sites, uh, focusing on the late glacial termination and the Holocene, uh, and I will compare Montagne d'Ambre, so north of Madagascar, uh, based on our results and also um, in Montagne d'Ambre and the Trivakeli uh, Lake record, uh, the only one recorded in Central Island going uh, uh, beyond the 2000 year before present and uh, encompassing also Lake Cotanari, uh, Lake, Castle, Lake Castle transition. So I will start first with, um, with uh, the north of Madagascar, so focusing on the Late Holocene, comparing uh, Nozi Bay results uh, and Montagne d'Ambre. So uh, as we have seen just before, it's quite clear that uh, human impacted this island uh, at least for 1,300 years before present. And uh, so if you want to, to learn more uh, on that, there is also the publication which was published this year on uh, frontiers in ecology and evolution. But now I will present and compare this result um, to Montana Nam, which is quite close from the Zibet, just a few hundred kilometers. So Montana Dam is uh, located close to uh, Diego Suarez or Anseranana, and this is a volcanic area. And for paleoecologists like me, it's really a nice area because there is many natural lakes and uh, volcanic lakes, uh, which are a really good recorder of uh, past environmental changes to perform, for example, paleontology, but also sedimentology, and uh, obtain also other record like isotopic data, charcoal data, and compare everything together to to understand what was happening in the past. So, uh, as I said, there is uh, many lakes in this mountain, and uh, we studied several of uh, them. Uh, so, in this case, I will present new results from the Lake Mansarika, which is located at 1,000 uh, meters above sea level inside the evergreen humid forest. And today, around this mountain, we have uh, dry savanna uh, or dry forest or, or dry forest and savanna. But uh, mainly the vegetation around the mountain dam is a disturbed uh, savanna and, and forest uh, due to human impact and recent human impact. Can DNA help trace the local pango? Can DNA help trace? Okay, so it's fine. So uh, the lake Masarika, as I said, is uh, at the 1,000 meters above sea level. And this is a shallow lake, which is seven meters water depth. And we obtained in uh, 2018, the sediment core, which is about 4.5 meters uh, of, of sediment. So uh, here, this is a synthetic pollen diagram. And uh, we can see uh, that there is uh, some taxa, green are, are the tree taxa, and, uh, and uh, uh, brown are shrub or herbs uh, taxa. And we can see that there is some, uh, some vegetation dynamics before 1,000 years before present, but there is one main shift which is occurring during the last millennium, where most of the tree taxa uh, decrease and we have an increase of, of Poaceae and also Cyperaceae. So this uh, remembers slightly what uh, we had on Nozibe Island. And if you focus on the main pollen taxa of this diagram, for example, we can compare here on the upper part of the diagram in green, this is a Cyperaceae curve and on brown, this is a, a Poaceae curve. And uh, in red, this is the charcoal result showing the occurrence of, of fires in, next to, to, to the lake. And the, the last curve uh, is the magnetic susceptibility showing erosion. So what we can see is that we have a major shift of vegetation, as I said, which occur uh, around 1,000 years before present. So the first observation we can uh, do is that uh, uh, this uh, main vegetation shift was occurring uh, a bit after uh, the human impact, uh, um, the beginning of human impact on Nozibe, so a few, a few centuries later. And uh, we had a, a strong increase of grassland and cyperaceae, as I said, and fire all together. But also an, an interesting difference is that uh, uh, fire were occurring, but at the same time, at the beginning of, of, uh, of uh, fire, we do not have an increase um, of uh, susceptib magnetic susceptibility 
showing that uh, fire were not producing more erosion in the system in the lake catchment and then fire was certainly occurring outside the, the lake catchment. So this is quite, uh, this is not surprising. So there's a, there is a lot of fire in the surrounding of Mountain Bandam, but not in the forest. And the forest next to the lake is not burning because it's quite humid, but fire are occurring all around the mountain and, and charcoal, I think, uh, come from the low elevation uh, where the savanna is burning. And it was probably the case also 1000 years ago. So the question is, okay, so we have a fire occurring uh, next to the Montagne d'Ambre at that time, 1,000 years ago. And the question is, it's uh, about the vegetation shift. It was occurring uh, local to the catchment or outside the catchment, uh, in, in which area was uh, occurring the vegetation changes. So uh, to answer the question, is it's not it's, it can be a bit tricky because uh, Poissé, for example, it could reflect a local a vegetation of grass next to the lake, but if you have a savanna development at low elevation, so some of these poissé could come also from the low elevation, like charcoal, with the same process. But um, for cyperaceae, this is not uh, probably not the case. So it was the first hypothesis based on cyperaceae. Uh, normally, uh, cyperaceae are living uh, on the on the edge of the lake, and then an increase of cyperaceae. Could show, that, could, could show just uh, a decrease of lake level and an increase of shallow lake condition, showing that at the same time that fire are increasing, you have a, a decrease of, of lake level. So to confirm this, this hypothesis, we had a look also about the C13 signal within the sediment. And uh, at the depth of uh, the shift of charcoal and cyperace and poisse, we have a clear signal uh, of, um, of C13 showing a development of uh, C4 grass, for example, and uh, showing that uh, we have a, a clear change on the catchment of the lake. So that means that the forest, I think the forest was still there around the lake, but the lake level was certainly decreasing and allowing the development of, of Poissé, for example, on the shore of the lake and Cipérasse. And to confirm this pattern, we can just have a look on the, on the modern uh, how it looks like the lake today. So on the upper picture, we can see that the forest is uh, surrounded by uh, the, the, the lake, sorry, is surrounded by forest. And uh, when you are inside the crater, you can see that you have a, a, an area which is quite flat uh, that allows the development of, of grass, of course, and cyperace. And when the lake level is quite low, all the vegetation is occurring next to the lake. That's why I think uh, at the same time, we had a fire increase in the region, an important fire increase, like you can see from 1,000 years before present. We had also an important development of grass and, and cyperace showing a lake level decrease at the same time. So we can resume the process uh, uh, like that. So before 1,000 before present, we have a, a deep uh, lake. And then after 1,000 years before present, we have increased certainly of anthropogenic fire with lake level decrease showing also probably a precipitation decrease at that time at that time together. So to, to conclude on, on that, we can compare the two sites. So uh, uh, Nozibe, which is in the middle, where we had a, a big increase of Poissé at 1,300 before present. The charcoal increase at the same time and the erosion with the peak of charcoal of magnetic susceptibility and increase of Poissé all together. And then below we have Mass Arica Lake, where we do not have this increase of erosion and magnetic susceptibility, but just the increase of charcoal and the shift of vegetation showing all together lake level decrease and increase of anthropogenic fire certainly at the same time. And uh, this uh, change about lake level and the fire uh, increase was occurring a bit later on Mass Arica. And if you compare also to a precipitation record from record from East Africa, for example, we can see that we have uh, in this uh, region of the world a decrease of precipitation during the medieval climate anomaly that could uh, explain why anthropogenic fire were increasing a lot also during this period, maybe because of drier, because of drier conditions. So to, to resume, uh, I think at a local scale, like in Nozibe, we had uh, human impact was uh, restricted to this island or to this area more or less. And you had a strong increase of anthropogenic fire at local scale. And uh, maybe these uh, fires were intensified during the medieval climate anomaly uh, because the precipitation were decreasing. So based on that, we can 
proposed several hypotheses. So did this drought, uh, maybe this drought was um, was triggering uh, some mega fires, or um, because of this drought at this period, maybe people colonize new areas, or maybe also because of the dry condition, people shift to other agricultural practices, or, or maybe some population were selected according to this to, to, to these agricultural practices. So, so for, to, to, to finish on that, I think it's really important to understand um, at regional scale, at least, uh, to, to, to compare several sites to, to do not, uh, to do not uh, present um, somehow, um, to, to be able to retest some hypothesis and give uh, some input about uh, how exactly human impact uh, uh, alterated ecosystem or if also climate was also part of, uh, of the shift uh, during the past billion. I think it's really important to compare these different sites in, uh, in one region. So now I would like to, to move to, to a second example. So uh, comparing two sites. So uh, I want, for this uh, presentation, I wanted to compare the one record we, we have uh, in Montana Dambo and compare things the uh, Holocene and the last glacial interglacial transition. So until 20,000 years before present. And um, the only one record, record existing in Madagascar uh, on this time scale is the, the Lake Tritrivakeli in the Central Highland. And I wanted to, to know if there is some, uh, um, some uh, common signal or not on, on this common period between North and Central Madagascar. So to, to focus on this period, on this time scale, um, uh, I will present the result of one other lake, which is the Lake Modi close to the mountain top of Montana d'Ambre. And uh, this is the Lake Modi here, close, uh, as I say, close to the mountain top. And the elevation is about 1,250 meters above sea level. And this is uh, again a shallow lake, uh, about three meters water depth. And to those, there is a pit bog growing on the lake. And uh, based on, on, on this, uh, we are able to work on this pit bog. And from that bog, we collected the sediment core, which is about 11 meters of length. So as I said, we are able to work on, on, until the central part of the of, of the pit bog, which was uh, which is the center of the lake, and based with the recent core, we obtain a, a sediment core about 11 meters, and this is uh, how how um, how is the core more or less. So we have two meters of pit bog, and then after uh, after two meters of pit bog, we are reaching. Uh, lacustrine sediment, which is about eight meters of uh, where, we, which is in, and this eight meters are encompassing uh, zero to fifteen thousand years before present, and uh, the last meter more or less is uh, we, we we obtain the sediment from the last uh, late glacial condition somehow. So here, this is the main pollen results uh, presented here with the synthetic pollen diagram. So we published this diagram uh, last year uh, in a publication with Elena Teixeira and co-author, and uh, where we were comparing uh, vegetation dynamics and the population and, uh, and demography of uh, mouse lemurs populations. So I think it's a really nice publication if you want to learn more about uh, past vegetation dynamics, but also about lemurs, of course. And uh, what we can see from, from that diagram is that you have uh, some change from, from the base to the top, from so 22, 23,000 years before present until recent condition. And you have different vegetation patterns at the base and on the top of the diagram. So we can, we can focus on the main, vegeta main vegetation types. For example, uh, if you look about mountain vegetation, this is a sum of all the brown taxa, Artemisia, Rica, Semirica, Podocarpus. So the evergreen humid forest sum. This is the sum of all the green tree taxa, which are most of these taxa in green are uh, tree taxa. And then we can also have a look on Poisson, aquatic plant taxa, and compare them all together. So what we can see based on this main result is that uh, before 15,000 15, years before present, we have a mixture of uh, evergreen humid forest and mountain vegetation. And uh, then from 50,000 years before the present, we have, we have uh, an important decrease of mountain vegetation and an increase of evergreen humid forest, showing that uh, uh, rainforest development at the expense of, uh, of mountain vegetation. So then uh, during the Holocene, the rainforest evergreen is quite stable until the last millennium, and the mountain vegetation is 
reaching almost 0% of the pollen counts. We can also have a look about uh, Poissy, uh, showing Poissy was uh, almost uh, uh, at low percentages, except during the last million, where we have an increase of uh, a significant increase of Poissy. And we can also compare that also with aquatic plants. But the aquatic plants differ a bit. We have two steps, uh, uh, an, an increase at 5,000 here before present, and a second increase during the last millennium. So we can interpret this aquatic plant as an increase of shallow lake conditions. So we probably had an increase of shallow lake condition from 5,000 years before present during the Holocene, so probably showing a decrease of precipitation. And then we have a second step increase, as we observed in Mars Arica during the last millennium, combined with Poissé. But this is also combined with increase of uh, charcoal, showing probably increase of anthropogenic fire in the region. So this confirms again what you have seen previously in Mars Arica Lake. Uh, the development of peat bog, in particular in Modi, occurred during the last period, um, uh, strengthening the result about the lake level decrease and precipitation decrease about the last period. But here I will not focus on that. I will focus more about dynamic uh, during the Holocene. So during the Holocene, we can see that uh, uh, at the mid, during the mid Holocene, particularly, it seems that we have a shallow lake condition increasing uh, and probably reflecting. Uh, the decrease of precipitation, which is exactly at the end of the of, of the African B period. So the African B period is well known in Africa. Uh, it's uh, following the uh, it's starting during the last glacial termination with important increase of humidity. When we do have this increase of rainforest, then the rainforest was quite stable, but Certainly, the precipitation decreased because of the shallow lake condition was decreasing, but the rainforest was resilient enough to survive and uh, the composition was not so much affected. However, if so, I will to resume this result. I will, I will just finish with that on, on Mars Arica and then I will uh, continue about the description of the rainforest. But so to conclude on the main result of vegetation changes before 50,000 years before present. We had a mixture of mountain vegetation and evergreen with forest, at least uh, close to the Lake Modi. Uh, at low elevation, we do not know uh, exactly uh, which kind of vegetation we had during the late glacial condition, because you do not have a record at low elevation. But uh, certainly during the African Uri period, so between 15,000 and 5,000 years before present, we had a, an extension of the evergreen with forest and the mountain vegetation disappeared somehow. And uh, from 5,000 years before present, with the precipitation decrease, maybe the ecotone tone of uh, the rainforest was uh, moving upward. But this we cannot see in the forest very well because uh, uh, we are close to the mountain top. And uh, during the last millennium, 900 years before present, or 1,000 years before present, we had a lake level decrease at, and at the same time, uh, an important increase of anthropogenic fire. Uh, in the surrounding of the mountain dam. So, um, as I said, during the Holocene, the rainforest, uh, except during the last millennium, is quite stable. But if you look more in detail, so the rainforest, which is here, we, we can see that you have many taxa inside the forest, uh, like Myrtaceae, Laocarpus, Macaranga maudis, etc. And uh, we can see that there is an important dy dynamic in between these taxa. Some are increasing, some are decreasing. And uh, it's possible to, to try to calculate an index, a uh, kind of ratio between uh, taxa, which show uh, uh, dominance of uh, humid rainforest, and uh, some taxa which show more disturbances inside the forest. So this is what I tried to, to do here, what I tried to do here, and with the ratio between Elaeocarpus and Weimania, which are normally corresponding to big trees in the rainforest, in mountain rainforest, uh, mountain rain, humid rainforest, uh, showing really wet condition against Trema, which is a pioneer tree taxa, and uh, which is uh, quite typical of uh, forest disturbances in this kind of vegetation. And I, uh, this and ratio was norm normalized with the logarithm, and I also compare this ratio with the, with the ratio of aquatic herbs uh, that we can see in blue here. Uh, and uh, when you have a, a low value, uh, high value series of of, uh, of this um, uh, index of aquatic plants, this show uh, 
uh, increase of uh, shallow lake condition and when it's decreasing you have a, a less shallow lake condition so probably a deeper lake and and again after 5000 an increase again of shallow lake condition so if you can see about the trend before 15000 before present you have low for resistances and uh, uh, shallow lake conditions are important somehow more important than uh, between 5000 and 15000 before present when uh, we have a decrease of shallow lake conditions and an increase uh, and a decrease of forest disturbances at this time. And then after 5,000 years before present, again, we have an increase of uh, shallow lake condition and uh, uh, an increase of uh, forest disturbances because of, at that time in particular, you have an increase uh, in trema on the pollen diagram. So we can compare this uh, this uh, main trend, for example, with uh, one record which is really well known in East Africa. This is uh, um, based on, on, on uh, deuterium on leaf wax from Lake Tanganyika. It's a really good record of precipitation changes in this region. And uh, we can see that uh, at the same time, uh, we have a, a decreasing of forest disturbances and uh, probably uh, an increasing of lake level. We have the settlement of the African wheat period, more or less at about 15,000 years before present. And this um, period was finishing more or less at 5,000 years before present where we have uh, uh, somehow uh, a decrease of lake level and an increase of forest disturbance in the, in the system. So now I wanted to compare this kind of main trend to the tree privacy to see, for example, if we do have also this African humid period on this lake. So tree privacy, which is uh, on the highland, was the first studied by uh, by uh, Bernay uh, for charcoal and pollen at low resolution, I think. But uh, then it was studied mainly by uh, Gas and Van Campo. Van Campo was doing the pollen counting. It was uh, published in 2001. And this is a very nice record in comparing uh, uh, at least uh, more than 20,000 years before present. But here I, I just compare the, the same period with, uh, with the north of Madagascar. And uh, we can see this is also volcanic lake, uh, which is located at uh, 1,700 meters above sea level, uh, next to Ansirabe uh, in the region of the island of Madagascar, central Madagascar. So we can see also here that you have a, an important decrease of mountain vegetation uh, before 15,000 years before present, mainly characterized as we have also in mountain number. This decrease is characterized by an important decrease of ericaceae. So more or less the same that we have in, in, in the north of Madagascar. But after the pattern is, uh, is uh, starkly different, uh, we have an important increase of uh, of grassland uh, from 15,000 years before present. And after 5,000 years before present, uh, Poissé are decreasing and forests are increasing with Celtis, Makaranga, etc. Different tree taxa which are increasing after 5,000 years before present. And of course, we have a, uh, during the last millennium, we have again an increase of, of, of grass made probably by human impact uh, in this region. So also something which is very really interesting, I think, in this diagram is uh, at, during the middle of scene, so like at 5,000, 6,000 years before present, we have a dominance of grassland uh, and Poissé was reaching uh, 40 to uh, 70, almost 70%, 60% of, of the pollen points. Uh, so, maybe grassland was quite important at that time, which is not so old somehow. And also an important uh, parameter to look is the aquatic plant. So when at the same time we have an increase of, of grassland, we also have an important development of aquatic plant, uh, mainly based on Citeras and Potamogeton, I think, on, on Tritrivakeli Lake. So uh, to resume, so during the Holocene, uh, it was, I think this site is really interesting because uh, we have an interesting shift in terms of vegetation between forest and, and grassland, uh, mainly during the Holocene. So I also tried also here to synthesize this result with um, with index. So uh, I, I used uh, uh, a normalized index uh, with with the ratio of Makaranga and Poissé, because Makaranga is also um, uh, typical of, of of forest in this, you know, of, of this region and developing also uh, as a pioneer taxa 
And, um, and I divided Macaranga by Poissy because it's, of course, representative of grassland. Like that, we can see when we have more or less the development of forest and, and a decrease of forest and development of forest after 5,000 years before present. And uh, I also normalized the aquatic herbs, as I did also in, uh, in Mountain Dam in the north. And uh, when you have a, a low value of aquatic herbs, uh, this show uh, um, decrease of uh, shallow lake condition. And when you have a, a, an increase of uh, this uh, aquatic normalized aquatic herb, this show increase of shallow lake condition. And so that means you have uh, an increase of shallow lake condition from 15 to 5,000 years before present during the, during the African humid period. And at the end of African humid period, you have a forest development and uh, and the uh, and, uh, and the decrease of, of uh, shallow lake condition. So interesting pattern is when we compare to the north. So uh, and it's surprising because uh, when we have uh, uh, particularly from the mid to late Holocene, when we have uh, in a decrease of forest development in, in central highland, uh, we have uh, low forest disturbances in the north. So probably a well developed uh, rainforest under the high humidity of the African mid period. And it seemed at that time that it was not so humid in the central highland because also uh, we have the max increase and then we reach the maximum of shallow lake condition based on, on aquatic herbs, uh, showing that lake level was probably uh, at low elevation which, during the African period in central highland. And, uh, in, and, uh, and it seems anti-correlated also again uh, when you consider the aquatic plants for mountain dam showing that uh, the lake, uh, shallow lake conditions are increasing after 5,000 years before present, probably showing uh, drier condition in, in the north and more humid condition in the central highland uh, when you have forest development and the decrease, uh, decrease of shallow lake conditions uh, in the central highland. So uh, to conclude, uh, so it means that the north is quite in phase with with what we observe to Lake Tanganyika, for example, but it looks quite different in terms of pattern uh, anti-correlated with what we observe at least from mid to late Holocene uh, with Tritrivakeli record. And to be honest, I was not so much surprised about this results because uh, uh, I was working uh, before my experience in Madagascar, I was working on East Africa and this pattern, which is uh, anti-correlated from North and the South, we can observe uh, quite well on, on East Africa. So this is a climate simulation uh, during the mid Holocene compared to modern condition, showing that you have more humidity on, around the equator, and then we shift to drier condition when we go to the uh, south of the equator in the East Africa. And we can see that we are also in between in Madagascar with, with the north of Madagascar, which is more humid based on our new record. And uh, on Central, Central Madagascar, climate condition was drier during the mid Holocene. So maybe uh, we, uh, we, that's why we have this uh, anti phase between uh, Montagne d'Ambre and, and, and Central Madagascar. So again, here I think it's uh, really important before to, to do some generalization of paleo record when you have only one site, it's really important to be, uh, to be cautious somehow and uh, uh, to compare also with other records when you have the possibility. Because I think all this kind of record are really local in terms of environmental changes. And to have a regional picture, it's really important to have a synthesis based on several records, which have the same uh, uh, quality about chronology and also indicator resolution, etc., to, to, to not mistake about interpretation at a regional scale. So thank you for your attention. And uh, so uh, I'm not working alone in Madagascar. I'm working with many colleagues. And I would like to thank, of course, uh, my uh, colleagues from Madagascar, because without them, uh, this would be not possible, but also colleagues from Germany and also from France and uh, from many different countries working on, on the same research in Madagascar. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vincent, for this interesting talk and overview about what we know and don't know about Madagascar's paleoecology. And uh, as we all agree, we will have first the three talks and then discussion. We move now over to Africa. And uh, now Julia Dival is, at least I can see you. The camera is working and I hope you can also now have a microphone that is working too.
I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. And now I would like you to upload and share your manuscript, uh, your, your slides and uh, give your talk. And then we will start the discussion right afterwards. Uh, I have written the animator deactivated the sharing of screen. Yes, one moment. I will do it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now you should be able. Yeah. Right. Is that okay? This is this is now it's okay. Yes, we see. Perfect. So, hello everybody. Today I will present some aspects how human-induced fires influence ecological dynamics in tropical landscapes. So, I study landscape burning history in Cameroon, in Central Africa, specifically in the village of Mbela Assam in the region of Adamawa. We are in the Sudan of Guinea and Savannah, a biome of transition between the tropical rainforests of the Congo Basin in the south and the arid latitudes of Sahel in the north. The savannas with more or less patches of dry forests uh, raise deforestation issues and question the anthropogenic origin of the landscape mosaic, where savannas created or maintained by humans and their fires along historical people's migrations and settlements and ways of using land. So uh, this is a typical view of the landscape I study, which burns every year during the dry season. A key challenge in this research is its interdisciplinarity as we aim to cross paleoecology with ethnoecology and remote sensing in order to catch the interactions between fire, humans, and vegetation on diverse temporal scales. This multi-proxy approach gives an acute understanding of socio-ecological and fire regime changes on a recent to ancient history from last decades to last centuries, always in the special frame of uh, landscape scale. So here is uh, how data collection was specially organized on the landscape during a field work of five months last winter. In paleoecology, uh, so lacustrian like sedimentary charcoal are a bioproxy to study fire and paleofire history. We went sailing two lakes far from one kilometer to sample sediment cores whose age was radio dotation with carbon and whose macroparticles of charcoal were on the whole length of the cores. For the ethnoecology part, we collected local or traditional knowledge through uh, different tools, qu qualitative and quantitative surveys, uh, participant observations, which imply that you share dairy life with people in activities such as burning, participatory mapping and uh, creative quantitative tools to get data on fire, burned biomass and their evolutions that will be easy to compare to the other disciplines pool of data. And for the remote sensing part, um, we will use Landsat 8 images and GPS waypoints to reconstruct land use land cover change and burned biomass since the early 80s. As preliminary results, we understood that in the savannas, uh, traditional fire use performs three different functions of subsistence, basically divided according to ethnicity. The self-proclaimed autochthonous people, boom, historically practice slash and burn or Sweden agriculture. The Fulani or Mbororo herders use fire to regenerate the herbaceous stratum to feed their cattle. And the Gbaya burn the bush for hunting. And these different practices lead to various sub regimes of fire, which diversely affects the mosaic of habitats that constitute the savanna, according to the floristic composition of each habitat. 
from fire adapted to fire independence or fire sensitive vegetation. Concerning the history of fires, uh, here you have the evolution of quantity of burned biomass through time. During the last two millennia, based on sedimentary charcoal, and during the last five decades, based on people's knowledge and perceptions. Please note that the abscissa axis is graduated uh, on depths of sediments and not in time, as we are still waiting for the lead radio datation analysis. And crossing these paleo and ethno results with historical data enables to discuss fire and landscape evolution in Adamawa, this historic land of pastoralism, through the migrations and settlements of various peoples, through changing political contexts such as colonization and post-colonization, governance and discourses, or through biological invasions. As you can see, if historical fires were quite variable in a distant past, fires are currently diminishing. The structure of vegetation is a key question in savanna ecology, so we also focus on the type of uh, burned biomass. Is it a grassy or woody fuel? Thanks to the morphology of charcoal particles and thanks to people's explanations. <clears throat> I will rapidly present a little focus on contemporary evolution of landscape fire, studying specific ecological interactions. Uh, because among the diversity of burning vegetation and practices that I just presented you, a part of my work focuses on pastoral burning, affecting shrubby woody savanna, as these fires are intrinsically larger and less controlled than the fires of agriculture. But above all, because Pastoral fires are lighted by a semi-nomadic Fulani people named the Zambororo people who suffer a kind of ostracization linked to a cultural gap and agro-pastoral conflicts. In spite of the fact that fire is used by everybody over there to the question who burns the savanna, the common answer is the herders Mbororo do and few or no consideration is paid by scientists and local administration to the importance of this traditional fire use, in particular on its role of maintaining savannas structure and biodiversity and controlling the risk of wildfire through fuel loads limitation. The other points which caught my attention is the recent invasion of the plant Cromolena odorata, which has 20 years, replacing the grass, which was a major resource for cattle and housing for the Mbororo people. So I interested in fire regime evolution and pyrodiversity in Mbelasom as a fixed point, experiencing mobility of different populations that may constitute contrary driving forces on landscape fires. Very briefly, uh, what's happening today is that this by reducing and fragmenting grassy fuel. I don't know if it's just me, but I can't hear you anymore. Uh, yeah, for me, it's the same. Some maybe it has something to do with your animated videos. Yes, they take a lot of space. But, uh, your voice comes, but very disturbed. Maybe All forward one slide from the animations away. Maybe it will work again. One further. Can you go to the next slide?
Uh, I don't know how to. Do ah. ah, okay. What's happening? So now it's she's gone. No, she is there. Is she? You are there, but the presentation is gone. I can't. Hey? See. The presentation we can't see. Can, can can't you see. hear me? Yes. Now it's good. Present. You you are there. Okay. Okay. I will start again. Juliet, maybe turn off your this, video for better this transmission. Slide was okay. You you hear me on the slide? Yeah, this slide was the problematic one. That was where it got worse. Maybe. I would say. Maybe you want to go to the next slide. Okay, so I. I go to the next slide, so <laughs> you yeah. can't hear. No, yeah, yeah. Now is it I okay? Can... You can hear me. You, we can oh, hear. I'm very you now. sorry. Yes. Great. So I, I will start again here, as uh, this resumes the main results. So to the question of landscape and fire evolution in Embelas um, during the last decades, we have now the water plants. Fires have been diminished in favor of agriculture fields make seems to be one of the main knowledge and resilience this activity of uncontrollable wildfire in the future in a drier context of climate change. Secondly, as cultivation remains the only more large extent early season fires of herders, which regenerated grass replaced by more sick circumstances and burning of cultivators. And they choose their lands in the gallery forests along the rivers because soil is more fertile. So this was the hydrological functioning of the landscape. And so water resource management, once more in a drier context of climate change. And to move a step backwards, uh, we have a third uh, major with these and issues of learning. Here we can emphasize that unlike in terms of royal ecosystems and were frequent and the history may be blurred by memories is more aggro yeah it's a shame the transmission yeah, we have lost you again <laughs> it was very difficult to understand so if she comes back, Juliet, if you can hear us now, if you are back, I can hear you now. But uh, okay, um, it was it was impossible with the slides. So, but I, I think as you had mainly text, maybe you want to repeat the last messages from your last one or two slides, just without the slides, without showing them, because I think. There were you can you can better speak and we listen to you than not not hearing anything. <laughs> yeah, okay. My my connection is quite bad. I'm sorry. Um, 
uh, I was talking about the last and third main results of my PhD, which is that um, interdisciplinarity crossing natural and human sciences is fertile, notably to face specificities and issues of tropical burning. Because uh, the fact is that unlike in temperate or boreal, or bo or boreal sorry, ecosystems and Western societies, in tropical landscape, fires are much more frequent and their history may be blurred by a memory in oral tradition. And another central point is a more political one. We need to remind that burning is a major tool across the intertropical belts in societies where agriculture does not rely on mechanical or chemical techniques and where the alternance of dry and humid season put fire as a classic perturbation, controlling a high primary productivity. Yet fire ecology is keeping its roots in a Western vision of destructive landscape fires, motto of deforestation, representing a, an archaic techno-economic phase along the long road of the development and evolution of human race. So in this context, fire evolutive ecology needs to give baselines, points of references, frame of variability. And a goal of my work is to translate disciplines one to another. I work with people who talk different languages, but may study the same objects, the same questions, such as human and landscape interactions. That's why I'd like to outline some mutual benefits of crossing methodologies and visions to paleoecology, bioarchaeology, remote sensing. Social science may support a human anchory, a territorial anchory. You work with people and build your research on problematics they experience in their landscape. This increases the potential impacts of those researches that often aim to address management and conservation goals. On the other side, to ethnology and politically quantitative, specialized and dated arguments, land does not lie as we hear everywhere in Cameroon. And finally, to ecology sciences in general, interdisciplinarity enables to catch a better articulation between the different scales of evolutionary mechanisms. Uh, I will stop here. I'm sorry for the problems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Juliette, for this interesting talk. Uh, it certainly contains a lot of food for thought. And I'm also very sorry that there were these uh, problems because we would have liked to see your slides, of course, and uh, enjoy the animations and the videos uh, a lot. So, okay. Thanks uh, all the three speakers again. And now we have time for a discussion. And if you have a question, maybe you indicate that in the chat or you raise your hand. I feel we have not so many people here, so I can probably also see if you just raise your hand then we can um, go from there. Is there any question to any of the speakers of today? Uh, ah, okay, Anna-Marie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the nice um, three talks. Um, also coming from research in Madagascar, um, Vincent, you mentioned um, that there was a shift of agricultural practices and I, I, I wanted to ask you if you can like elaborate a bit on that how it changed and what exactly changed um, you, you mean, compared um, to today. I, you mean a shift I, I think um, maybe I was uh, not um, it was not enough precise I was um, proposing um, a possible shift in terms of agricultural practices when you have this transition at 1000 correct it was a point where, uh, because yeah, the thing is uh, when you have this increase of uh, fire activity and uh, when you have also this increase of precipitation at, during the last millennium, I proposed different hypotheses. So one of the hypotheses was uh, we observed this uh, fire increase because of mega fire occurrences uh, made by uh, 
precipitation decrease, or people who are moving to other places under dry conditions in Madagascar, or maybe people shift between uh, more uh, slash, uh, more, um, for example, hunting to uh, slash and burn agricultures. But after to know exactly which kind of practices we do have in the past, we are a bit limited based on the traditional uh, paleo-environmental paleo proxies. So to learn more about that, it will be necessary to, to have, for example, fossil DNA or to, uh, to, to use other proxies like phytolis to see if there is some, um, some um, uh, plants like rice, rice uh, agriculture, for example, or different kind of cultures. But just based on pollen uh, tax sites, it's a bit difficult to say which kind of uh, practices is, uh, people are using. But at least when you have such level of fires, like in Nozibe, uh, I think uh, people were using uh, fires for grazing. But after which kind of animal is difficult to say. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, maybe I jump in with one question here. I don't see a hand up uh, for Juliette. Um, I was interested, you had these three different groups, ethnic groups, who seem to be living in very different ways uh, together with their environment. And um, how do they live there? Do they really live together overlapping or have they divided the space among them? Have you they some kind of territories or different places where they live or how do they manage and negotiate between each other with so very different ways of lives? Uh, thank you for your question. Actually, it's a kind of a cultural melting pot with more or less tensions between peoples, but they they, they used to uh, stay in their own sphere of uh, tribe. I mean, they uh, they marry just between the same tribe. They share um, act jerry activities inside the same tribe. Um, concerning the sharing of lands. Uh, traditionally, everything was uh, decided by the traditional chef, chief, uh, the, the king of Mboum. But more and more, the um, institutional, the state actually the, is a uh, Important between uh, herders and cultivators because they, that is uh, which which spreads the idea that you, you will have value, your activity will have value if you practice agriculture and not uh, herding. Mm -hmm. okay. But actually, it's quite pacific. Relationships are, are good. Are good. Okay. Okay. And maybe one uh, follow-up question or one question you mentioned at the beginning that fires are diminishing um is that because uh, is a decrease in herding and uh, an increase in other activities there was some one slide where you mentioned that uh, historically there was a lot more fires um several decades ago and now recently there is a decrease in fire can you explain or elaborate on that again what the background yeah, is? Yeah, the, <clears throat> actually, it's it's just preliminary results for the moment. But um, thanks to the charcoal signal, we can see that fire have diminished a lot, but we cannot say uh, at what moment yet, because we haven't the radio datation results yet. Um, from the service results, we can say that the how to say the cause to consequence uh, chain everything comes from this invasive plant from Molenaudorata, which is replacing grass. So uh, fire regime are modif modified, and we have less grassy fuel, less connectivity between this grassy fuel. So it burns less. 
we have an afforestation, so uh, people, so there's no more grass, so beef uh, are dying and people need to convert to agriculture just to feed themselves. Okay. So apparently fire is diminishing in a, in a more uh, long time uh, tendency of afforestation that uh, is existing since the beginning of the Holocene for Central Africa. Okay, now I get it. I think I missed that part because of some problems of transmission in between. But you were talking somewhere in your talk also about this invasive plant. But <laughs> the story somehow slided away. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Is there any other question? There was one in the chat. Ah, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. There is one question for Juliet. Uh, does the presence of Chromolena odorata in this region affect her favoring the progression of fires in the savanna? So the answer is no. It, it's stopping fire. It's stopping fire. And when you search, like on Google standard articles, uh, I mean, from, um, yeah, common medium, uh, Comerina odorata is seen as a good plant, like, hey, it's a plant saving the forest in Central Africa because it's stopping fires. But yes, okay, in terms of uh, carbon stockage, carbon storage, it can be a good news. But in terms of uh, functionality of savanna and uh, especially herding, it's bad news. Where does this plant come from? Invasive French agronomists agronomist who introduced these plants initially coming from Laos, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and it was introduced in the middle of the 20th century because it was a good coberture plant for cocoa and coffee plantations. My goodness, yes. Hmm. All messed up. Okay. Yeah, this plant is considered like evil by mm. people over there. It's the main problem, the big problem. They were always, please just find the solution for us concerning this plant. Mm. This is, uh, yeah, a major point in my research. Hmm. Okay, so I think that ends. Uh, and it's incredible how how fast such an invasion can be, and how important the effects on fire regime and so then on landscape evolution, uh, such an, a biological invasion can have. I mean, it's very rapid, and it's a kind of phenomenon that uh, we we would have difficulties to uh, identify in a paleoecological study because we, we think in a much larger scale of time. Hmm. Sure, sure. Hmm. Okay, any other question? Yes, Melanie. I have one. I'm not sure it's actually a question. It probably illustrates totally my, my ignorance, but I'm I'm always so absolutely fascinated by this time travel that you can do. And and one of the big questions, of course, in Madagascar always was uh, how old are the savannas? And this was a, a long debate. And I mean, now the, it, it hinges to one, one answer. But the question is, can you contribute to this debate with your data from your pollen course? Um, and more specifically, like, can you do say anything about the diversity of plants in these poaci dominated phases? Mm. Yeah, do you mean uh, grassland or savanna? Yeah, grassland. Gra yeah. Grass grassland. Both actually. Yeah, both. Okay. So me, so far, I, I never worked in the Central Highland, uh, about pollen data. I was mainly working in the north. I think the question about grassland or savanna is mainly focusing on the highland in Madagascar about if it was dominated by forest or grassland. But uh, I, I think uh, first, it's, uh, for the, there is only one record today 
uh, going beyond the middle of things. This is a lake of Tritrivakeli, as I said. And I think to retest hypothesis about grassland and savanna in the highland, it will be really necessary to use uh, several records to compare if uh, they have a, a kind of similar trend or not about forest or, or grassland. Because as you have seen on Tritrivakeli, from the beginning to mid Holocene, it was uh, the pollen, uh, pollen um, diagram was dominated by grassland, by Poissé taxa. And so I think uh, grassland was uh, probably present before human impact. And it was uh, probably a mixture between forest and grassland. And, and the question is, uh, was uh, in terms of uh, forest cover, in terms of grassland cover, how, how it was exactly. And to answer this question, I think we need really first to have uh, several records to compare in between them because uh, uh, this, this grassland may come, could be really local to the lake, for example, or not. But uh, to know this, we need more records. Yeah. But, but is there any any way of saying something about the speed that kind of certain pollen uh, assemblages, let's say, arrive? You know, let's say you have a, a habit, a rapid habitat change, and then yeah. you have this next years in your in your core, and then I mean, there there must be something about the speed of of new species arriving in this in this new uh, species assemblage that you can compare to other regions in the world where you know probably more about this this changes um, you see what i mean like uh, just to get a bit you know to these ecological questions of about you know species diversity and and time of arrival of certain species in a new newly formed uh, yeah system. but I, I think uh, to have this kind of if i will understand i think it will be uh, you mean uh, you are just thinking about zero sin i think to have these long uh, things about uh, Evolution, we will need a, a record which are going deeper in time, right? Or no, it's not evolution. It's more like ecological change. Like if you have um, a drastic system changes, then then you know from the species pool, certain species arrive, mm -hmm. and how fast they arrive has something to do, of course, with the diversity around. Yeah. And okay. if we, for example, don't have any grasslands around in, in big proportions, then it will take a long until. You know, a lot of uh, different species might arise. Yeah, to, to my opinion, I think grass uh, grass uh, were always occurring in Madagascar. So after it's just about proportion, it was dominated by forest or grassland. But shift of vegetation can be really fast. Uh, depends of the disturbances. So if it's just a precipitation or temperature, or if it's fires, I think with fires can be really fast. But uh, after depends of so the, the speed of migration of the plants. So some some trees or some some elves move faster than the others. For example, they worked on that in in Central Europe, looking at the colonization of uh, of tree after the the migration, and some trees were faster than than the others. But to, to conclude about that, uh, in Europe they have uh, uh, hundred and hundred sites of uh, of paleo data. And then we can compare the speed in between taxa. But for that, uh, in Madagascar, we clearly have not enough data because, uh, as I said, for just highland, for data that go beyond the mid Holocene about pollen data, there is only two sites. So Central Island and the one we studied in Montagne d'Ambre. So there is clearly not enough data to, to, to look about uh, migration speed of, about this taxa, for example. But yeah, you, you. You, can, you can have some differences uh, in between taxa. Are there other questions? I, I have one for Antonia. Um, and I noticed when you were showing your pollen diagram, your interesting uh, succession of composition of your samples, and you had this line where you say, here is impact of humans, but it was clearly visible that the the dynamics of the pollen started already sometime before. So how do you come to decide where exactly you put this line? Because the shift set in uh, apparently a bit earlier than you put the line. So what is your rationale for that? Yes, it's um, always a little bit hard to put the starting point of human impact, of course, because you can never be too sure if it's really um, human impact or maybe just natural vegetation change. Um, so here you have to um, 
yeah, kind of that's why we decided to put it in the middle because starting at that point, we can be sure this is due to human impact and not due to um, somehow uh, we have a little bit of drier climate. Um, however, what can also be said, this is a time span of maybe 50 years. So in our um, research, 50 years does not mean a lot so we put it there to be safe but of course it can be that uh, we have the start maybe 50 years earlier maybe also 50 years later it's um, a little tricky i would say but that's a uh, playing safe <laughs> okay there is some some variation in it and some room for flexibility yeah <laughs> <laughs> But you don't have something like error margins, right? This is something that uh, that you sometimes obtain in other disciplines. But for you, it's just you have the sample and you have what is in there, and there is not. It's not so easy to say it's plus minus so and so, right? Mm, yeah, but we have errors for the uh, dating, so this is also uh, that's true. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, there are other questions yeah i only had a simple question maybe for the end <laughs> as a um, person um, who is a bit um, still new to paleoecology i was wondering how you guys select your sites for data collection and um, why is it always lakes is it because these are like stable environments or because you knew this um, specific location was very stable and didn't change over a long time or why not just choosing random places why exactly the places that you selected maybe it's a really simple mm. question for paleoecologists mm. but uh, yeah for me <laughs> I think it's a really good question because uh, it's a really important question when you are looking for sites uh, a good site for paleoecologists uh, we need um, uh, sites where the sediment uh, was accumulating um, continuously without uh, hiatus in the sediment to have a, a continuous record of environmental changes. And in the tropic, the difficulty is that uh, frequently you have important dry, dry period. And then if you have dry period, the, the lake can uh, dry it out. And if you dry, if the lake dry, dry out, then you will uh, lose uh, some sediment and then you will have hiatus. So then that's why it's really nice to have a deep lake to avoid uh, or to have a, a lake in mountain environment, like that you have also more humidity. That's why in Madagascar it's quite difficult to, to find a good site at low elevation, because the low elevation were subject to important drought in the past, and then it's really tricky to find a continuous record at low elevation compared to mountainous environment, or it would be also easy if you love deep lake at low elevation, but then uh, also to, 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 to sample sediment core when you are in a deep lake, it's also more complex uh, if you if you have to do field work uh, with a short with a shallow lake somehow. So it's uh, depending of that, and of course we do not have lakes everywhere, unfortunately. So then it depends also about the, the the where we have lake. But yeah, yeah. yeah interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think you already said it. We are slowly coming to the end. Um, and I just want to take the uh, opportunity to remind everybody uh, what, I don't know why this is not showing. Um, no, where am I? Here am I. The upcoming uh, TU talks, I hope you can see, although it may not be in a presentation mode. Here we go. Um, we have one one meeting, one TU talk series in January about mangrove ecology and another one in February on island biogeography. And uh, everybody who's here is welcome to join us again for this for these uh, nice topics and uh, to stay with us for the next uh, TU seminar, uh, which will then come. And uh, yeah, I think then we have reached now the end of today's um, seminar, and this is the last of this year. So I wish everybody a nice holiday season and um, kind of a bit of a relaxing end of the year with whatever you are busy with. And uh, we go fresh into the new year. So 
Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.